Are there any other things on that issue? Do, do you see the consensus changing slightly? Do you still find that you're having to convince people that we don't, uh, you know, important people, uh, important roles that we don't need to double the food output? Or are you seeing uh, uh, a kind of negative effect? Do you find that you're still fighting the same battle? Absolutely. And indeed, the battle is getting more intense every day. I, I want to put the, the optimistic uh, and, and success stories that I started with in context. Um, uh, you know, I do still have uh, hope and I am really inspired and um, I rejoice in the great impacts that we've had over the last 20 years. I think now um, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people have engaged in, in the issue of food waste. It's shot up the agenda. We've had measurable and meaningful gains. Um, loads of businesses like my own Toast Ale have started uh, within the sector, you know, upcycling food that would otherwise be wasted. It really is a, 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 a fantastic thing. Um, but to put that in a, in a rather darker context, um, these are ripples on an ocean and the tide is still fastly, fastly going, it, it quickly going the wrong, wrong direction still. Um, if you look at all of the trajectories with the food system and with our relationship to nature, um, most of them are getting worse and some of them are still accelerating in the wrong direction. Um, deforestation continues, the mass species extinction event uh, is in full swing. Uh, food production is the single biggest source of greenhouse gas emissions. It's by far the biggest user of fresh water. It still causes most of the soil erosion that happens in the world. Uh, much of the marine pollution and riverine pollution comes from farms and food systems. Um, and of course, the food system, the way it's run at the moment, is at the heart of the biggest um, uh, human health crisis on Earth. And that's not the crisis of hunger, although that is in itself a big one affecting nearly a billion people, the crisis of overconsumption, uh, obesity and diabetes and all of those things. So the food system is right at the heart of our biggest problems. Um, and I see the chance of arresting this crisis in its tracks as becoming smaller and smaller. Um, if you wanna know what I really think, I think we'll probably fail uh, in this agenda, we will probably see that most species on Earth will be extinct by the end of the century. We will probably see that some of the most amazing and unique ecosystems like the Amazon rainforest will be absolutely decimated uh, by the end of the century. And we'll probably see an awful lot of human suffering um, that goes with climate change and other ecological disasters. And these problems will be irreversible and they'll be catastrophic. Um, do I think that's inevitable? Uh, no, I don't. The whole reason why I focused the, uh, on a terrible. The whole reason why I focused on food waste and the successes of food waste is that it shows we really can make a difference if we mobilise in a in a active, engaged and and holistic way, we can make a huge difference. And the way I like to think about it these days, um, and I see this running through my work right from back when I was a child. Um, and by the way, if I wasn't sitting in front of my computer and I could get you on my mobile phone, I'd take you down to see the descendants of the very same pigs uh, down in my farmyard, uh, eating uh, food waste still from the supermarkets. Um, that, that goes on. Uh, and, I, and I feed my family of, um, yeah, household of 10 people with, with all of the, the delicious pork that, result, that results in it. Um, but um, what I see uh, as, a, as a potential pathway is, uh, I love the word um, companion. And it's become, I don't do yoga, I don't have a spiritual practice, I'm not religious, I don't believe in, in, in divine forces looking after us. Um, but I do, I do have a practice that I call companionship. Um, a companion, uh, of course, anyone who um, knows their Latin knows that com, of course, means with and pan means bread. Uh, I see there is a lot of Italians uh, here today. Uh, compagno, uh, of course, uh, 
it's with bread in French, copain, Spanish and Portuguese, campanero. Uh, even in Greek, syntrophos, any Greek speakers will know that that means with food. A companion is somebody you share food with. And indeed, the sharing of food to build friendship and society is a universal human behavior. Every single society in the world uses the sharing of food to build friendship. And indeed, not sharing food with somebody, if you leave somebody out of a meal, that is also universally a stigmatizing gesture. That is uh, the ultimate way of casting somebody out, is not to let them sit at the table. And indeed, it is not just a human behavior, it's a great ape behavior. If you look at our closest animal relatives, the sharing of food is fundamental to their social um, dynamics. If you look at our closest relative, the pygmy chimpanzee or bonobo, um, when they have surplus food, they proactively go and find other bonobos to share it with. Uh, and rather intriguingly and beautifully, that they will select strangers over and above friends uh, as uh, their partners to, to share food with. This might seem counterintuitive, uh, but essentially what they're doing is turning surplus food into social capital. Uh, they're making new friends, they're making companions. And I see the food waste scandal and the food system problems generally as an opportunity to regenerate the spirit of companionship. And that means in our own lives, of course, sharing food as a powerful force for bringing people together in our own households and beyond, but also in a more systemic way, when we buy food, if we choose to buy it from companies that are, uh, have responsible supply chains and are in good companionship with the suppliers, with the growers, with the earth, with their customers, then we can participate in restoring good companionship in the world. And what we see too often is a, is a broken form of companionship, this idea that hundreds of millions of people go hungry while other people overeat. The idea that we can pay companies to destroy the Amazon rainforest to produce cheap meat, that's bad companionship. And I think if we exercise good companionship in our personal lives, in our economic lives and in our political lives, we can use the food system to, um, well, to transform it from its, our biggest problem to one of our biggest solutions to, to actually use farming to take carbon out of the atmosphere and put it back into soils to create habitat, not destroy it, to replenish aquifers, not deplete them, and to build soils, not erode them. And we already know how to do all of those things. So I think we can, uh, we, we certainly have to, if we want to leave uh, to next generations, the, the beautiful blue and green planet that we've been so lucky uh, to, to inherit. To what extent is this scandalous process being propagated by institutions and companies who are really, I guess, keeping us in the reality, a lot of that waste isn't bad at all. So, so um, I have made it my life's work to make it hard for supermarkets and other food businesses to continue to hide uh, their food waste. And I think that that act of uncovering, as you pointed out, the, the name of my book, I'm covering that scandal, is, um, is a job that has, not entirely, but it has very largely been done. It is now impossible for big businesses to deny and hide their food waste. Too many of us in too many parts of the world have been round the back of the supermarkets, have been into the factories, have seen the mountains of food, photographed it. You mentioned Just Eat It. That's one of the many documentaries that I've participated in, in Italian, in Spanish, in French, in English, in German, all over the world. We've made documentaries demonstrating, filming and revealing the scale of the waste. And so it is impossible now to be a big food company in the industry and not have something to say about what you're doing to tackle food waste. Indeed, I mentioned that I'm a UN champion of the goal to 12.3 to half food waste. Alongside me on that champions group are the CEOs of Unilever, Tesco, Sodexo, Nestle, you know, some of the biggest food companies in the world. And they are very, very, very far from perfect companies, but they all acknowledge 
the waste that they produce and are announcing clearly what they're going to do about it. Now I'll just put a little, um, a little kind of extra layer to this. I, I, I've seen a lot of progress with regard to companies coming clean and doing something about it. As I say, we're a long way from, from being perfect, but there is progress there. The next step, the most important step, is for governments to regulate. Because without that, it's all very well having a bunch of companies doing relatively good things. If you leave it, the bad actors will continue to do the bad stuff. And that's why you need laws in place. And you mentioned hiding food waste. Uh, as, as an example, the United Kingdom is finally, after years of my, in particular in my book, again, I called for this piece of legislation, we should have mandatory, transparent reporting of food waste by big food companies. That's absolutely something that would help everyone solve it, uh, solve the problem. And we're now having a government consultation next month in the United Kingdom on whether or not there should be a law mandating uh, com big companies to, you know, making them report how much food they waste. Um, and that is the next step. We, we've seen lots of progress from companies. Now we need robust laws and we need them not just at the nation state level, which frankly by itself is not going to save planet earth. We need it at an international level. And that without that, without that global governance layer, uh, I see very little hope in solving our biggest problems. We need global governance and global policies to tackle global problems. So that would be, why is it taking such a long time? And why is there so many obstacles towards radical change? If we need such a radical change, why, why is it not happening? You think that when presented with the facts and your prognosis, change would happen far sooner. Uh, why is it taking so long? Why is it taking so long? Well, I see the world, the human civilization, as being locked into a tragedy of the commons of the most colossal and catastrophic scale. Uh, the reasons for that, the, if, if I can sort of simplify the situation, is that um, corporations are multinational and governments are national. And this inherently creates an imbalance of power. And the multinational corporations are playing the nation states off against each other. And um, we've seen this with tax regimes, for example, you know, all the big giant tech companies uh, situating themselves in countries with the lowest tax jurisdictions. And this creates a dynamic where the nation states want to go to the bottom of the, um, of the tax, uh, you know, lowest possible tax regime to attract those corporations into their um, nation state jurisdictions. And this is running counter to the interests of absolutely everyone. Um, tax regimes are just one, environmental regulations are another. Uh, nation states are afraid to put in place robust environmental legislation because corporations will just say, screw you, I'll go somewhere else then. And we have this, um, this dynamic running throughout our entire society. And we send our nation state governments to the international fora to go and thrash out international policy. But unfortunately, we send them as representatives of their nation state. And that unfortunately means that they are going to the international fora with a very clear job description from their electorates, which is go and carve the biggest slice of cake you possibly can in that international forum for us. And that pits the nation states against each other. That is never going to result in satisfactory global governance. That is not global governance, that is international governance and it doesn't work. What we need if we want to solve this problem, if we want to unlock the tragedy of the commons is global governance. And the kind of structures I'm talking about, if you think about how the European nation states divested themselves of specific powers, which are now decided on by the commission and when we send delegates from our countries to join the commission for their period of four years, they do not go as representatives of their nation state. They go as representatives of the bloc and they make decisions on behalf of the bloc and they make decisions on the behalf, uh, in the interests of everyone in the bloc, not just their little corner of it. 
And that is what we now need for the world. We need to divest specific powers. I've mentioned a couple. Tax jurisdiction is one. Environment is another. And I would argue that probably the first that will actually happen is global health. And that brings me you know, to the, to the idea of where can COVID actually help us. It may knock down the door to creating a global governance platforms that nation states actually realize it is essential for us uh, to divest powers to. Um, and, and, and so that I think is the reason why we don't have effective uh, governance is because we don't currently have the, um, the global governance institutions that can solve these problems. Well, uh, building on that, though, are there any countries that you you know of at all that you would say are maybe a beacon of positivity uh, model? No. So everybody is culpable to the same degree, more or less. Uh, no, no, that's not that's not what I mean. Uh, what I mean is that. Um, of course, there are countries with some really wonderful policies. If you look at uh, the rights of nature granted uh, in Ecuador, if you look at how in New Zealand, um, a river has been given the same rights as, as personhood. Um, if you look at you know, the United Kingdom's policies on food waste, uh, if you look at the United States policy on, uh, on um, subsidizing food redistribution, uh, you know, if you look at international agreements such as the Montreal Protocol, you can find antecedents to the kind of thing that we need, where all nation states signed up to something and actually then went and more or less implemented it. So there are little its and bits. Um, there is no individual country that is capable of showing the kind of thing that we need, because the whole point is a country cannot solve a global problem. It does not have the powers to do that. And without the global approach, um, they, they, they will not succeed. And, I've, uh, and I gave you the example of the European Union. Now, it's an ironic example to give because the whole point is the reason why the nation states were willing to divest their powers to the commission is so that they could stand up as a block of nation states on the international stage to balance out the power of China and the US and other superpowers. Um, and if we hadn't all ganged together, we would, have, we would have been marginalized. So in a way, the European Union is a, is a reinforcement of the problem of the nation state competitive tragedy of the commons, but it still does show a very interesting process. And that process is one that we now need to be looking at at a global level. Um, the kinds of initiative that give me hope are not the nation states. Uh, they are uh, organizations like Democracy Earth, uh, run by my dear friends, Pierre Mancini and, and Santi Siri. These are the people that have gone into the future and said, OK, what does democracy look like when we start making decisions on behalf of humanity, one species on one planet? That is the kind of thing that gives me hope, that there are people now engineering the kinds of platform that ultimately we will need, we will evolve into. That is, all of the trends are going global. This doesn't mean we have to let go of local. It doesn't mean we have to let go of our national identity or our individual national cultures. All of those things should continue to be fostered in the same way that I have my household culture and that is not in any way compromised by the fact that I'm also part of a nation state culture or indeed a county or any of these other subdivisions but we do need to have the global level in order to tackle these global problems do you uh, have time for one more question do you think yes you were talking things that give you hope and organizations and okay so at the national level we're not doing so well but there are certain initiatives that are making a lot of change I just wanted to ask you about your, your beer. It's called Toast Ale for anyone that doesn't know about it. And um, essentially the, the premise is saving wasted bread and converting that bread into uh, drinkable beer. So I just wanted to know, uh, you know how that works a little bit and if that sort of approach to business where we can have a, a business idea uh, and then try and solve 
uh, sustainability issue at the same time. Do you see other businesses incorporating this? Yeah, yes, yes, and yes. Um, all of those things. So Toast Ale, uh, as you say, it grew out of, you mentioned those 13,000 slices of fresh bread that I saw being wasted in a single factory uh, that was throwing away the end slices of the bread that they don't use in sandwiches for, for the supermarkets. And that at the time made me really angry, really, oh God, I went to Pakistan that same year, uh, I say this in my TED talk, um, and met people who were no longer able to feed uh, their families because of a spike in global food prices. This was in 2008. Um, and there we were throwing away wheat and we were contributing to that problem of scarcity um, by throwing away all that bread. And it makes you so ashamed and angry that, that that's what we're doing. Um, and uh, then I learned uh, years later um, from uh, Sebastian Morvan, the Brussels Beer Project brewer, that you can turn that stuff into beer. And indeed, the ancient Babylonians created beer to um, ferment grains that would otherwise go to waste. That is principally what fermentation is, a preservation technology. The inebriation that results is a happy side effect. Um, and uh, so I started Toast Ale as a way of upcycling a problem into a solution. Um, it is run on the ethos by which I run my life, which is that um, if you want to save the world, you've got to throw a better party than the people destroying it. This has got to be fun. It's got to be engaging. It's got to be easy. It's got to be delicious. And, and the more parties we can have, the happier we're going to be and the more people will want to join us. Um, I'm not for hair shirts and, and, and uh, kind of depression. It's, it is bleak. It, it, we, have to, we have to acknowledge the anger. We have to acknowledge the real realistic trajectory that we're going uh, through. But we have to we have to make it sustainable for ourselves as well as for the planet and and having lots of fun is a is a absolutely certainly for me it's an essential part of my life i'm more of a hedonistic uh, environmentalist i like to think of us squeezing the last drop of um of joy and beauty and deliciousness from each other and from the wonderful bounty that nature gives us um and and not only uh, do we use the food that would otherwise be wasted as a way of um, uh, reducing the impact of our production? So we use that waste bread instead of virgin barley, which means we need a third less land to produce our beer than any other kind of beer. So imagine you had a car and you invented a car that used a third less fuel. That's the equivalent of what toast ale is. Um, we're having a catalytic effect. We open sourced our recipe so that now hundreds of brewers all over the world are copying us. Our recipe has been downloaded 80,000 times. We ourselves have upcycled more than 2 million uh, slices of bread that would otherwise have been wasted. And I don't know how many more millions are being brewed by other companies around the world using our, our idea. Um, and um, beyond that material flow, we also have a money flow. So we give our profits to Feedback, the charity I founded, and other environmental charities around the world, so that um, we can say that all of the money that we generate is going to contribute towards doing good in the world. It's much more sensible, in our view, for customers to give their money to companies such as ours um, than to give it to companies who are essentially going to create costs for everyone further down the line by creating social and environmental externalized costs like chopping down the Amazon rainforest or excessive pollution or injustice. These are things that we ultimately have to pay the, the cost uh, of. Um, but uh, with companies like Toastale, and I'm very pleased to say we're not alone, there is a growing, vibrant, regenerative economy um, that thinks about how do we use business to solve the problems that are being created rather than perpetuating them.